Uh, my name is Jake Ramgren. I'm the history and science and not science. That's the that's the distinction. History and Bible teacher here for middle school. Um, and so I've been interested in creationism, young earth creationists, been interested in creationism for a long time. Uh, and so I went down to college um, for science, for zoology uh, down in Jackson, Tennessee, and was involved with a couple of research projects down there. Um, got involved in creationism down there with a uh, alongside a professor that I actually sought out because I was really interested in creationism and found this professor, Jeremy Bloschke, uh, down there who got me involved uh, in creationism. So I started going to conferences. Um, I started uh, writing for a creation blog that um, called New Creation. Uh, so if you type in newcreation.blog, uh, it'll pop up or I have some some cards here with, with QR codes you can scan. Um, so I've been doing creation blogs, and then uh, I also now I'm starting to give creation-based uh, museum tours. Uh, so if you're interested in that as well, um, I do that for Springfield Science Museum or um, any other you know science museum that that uh, people are interested. I'm kind of um, that's just what I do. So creationism is kind of my passion, and so now that I'm here at the school, I thought this is a good opportunity to kind of get involved in this way. And so this is kind of a dream come true to me to give creation lectures like this and to take. Um, classes. I've taken high school high school class over to the Springfield Science Museum. Uh, a lot, all the middle schoolers here in seventh and eighth grade uh, got to see me give a tour down at the Smithsonian. Um, so that's kind of that's kind of me. That's where I'm coming from. So um, what I wanted to do for this series, I'm calling it the briefest history of time. It is a three part series. Uh, this part one is called Creation Reformation, and uh, you'll find out why. Um, but it's a three part series. This one will be a little more. Um, history focused and Bible focused, while the next two parts in the series will be, the next one will be very much focused on science, the science of, of creationism. And then the third one will be focused a little more philosophical and will be about kind of where creation research is going um, in the future, how it stands, uh, how it stands up in comparison to things like old earth creationism, theistic evolution, and of course, uh, the naturalistic or atheistic evolution. So that's kind of my, my three-part plan right there for you. And so we'll get started here. So this is, again, like I said, part one, creation reformation. I want to open with uh, a question and answer, I suppose, a question and answer that one of my uh, professors gave me at the very, very beginning of uh, one of his classes, a New Testament class, new professor, and he opened with the question, what is reality? Which is a very professor thing to do. Uh, what is reality? First day in New Testament. And um, it obviously stuck with me because this is my freshman year. So it's been a few years. Uh, and I still remember his answer. We all kind of looked around and thought about it. And um, none of us gave an answer because it's our first day of class. Um, but his answer was that reality is a story. Uh, that, that's what it is. Reality is a story. And the more I thought about it, the more I started, the more it kind of clicked that reality is, in fact, a story. And what really clicked for me is when I started to look through history, uh, especially here as a history teacher, you start to look at history and every way that people try to interact with reality or interpret reality or explain things in reality, they tell stories. Uh, and this dates all the way back to the very first uh, beginnings of history that we can see uh, with things like pagan religions. Uh, pagan religions told stories, uh, obviously, about their gods and their gods would explain why the sun rose and set and why the moon and the stars acted the way they did. Um, and they told stories about characters who fought and killed each other and fell in love and all sorts of things. And Egypt is just one uh, of the many mythologies that we have involving gods and involving storytelling. Um, fast forward to uh, the AD, a little, um, a little ways later, you have some more sophisticated um, explanations for things starting to arise. Uh, and while the Greeks did, of course, have many gods they worshipped, a branch of Greek thought um, went a little more philosophical than religious, and you still have great stories of uh, ex explaining how we got here. So instead of maybe a god of the sun and a god of the star that are running around the earth or however they would have explained it, you have Aristotle uh, supposing that an unmoved mover um, would have created the universe in one instant. And then he put the earth at the center of the universe and put stars and planets revolving around it. And what is kind of a pseudo scientific explanation of the world, um, Ptolemy would later take his model and add some mathematics to it to better explain things. He would remove uh, what Aristotle said was basically perfect circles. He said everything has to be perfect circle because a circle is a perfect shape and reality must be perfect. And it didn't really fit with the observations that he saw, but he didn't really care about that because he wasn't a scientist, right? He was a philosopher. He wanted things to make sense in his head. He didn't need to make predictions uh, or, or do any experiments. 
But Ptolemy said, look, your model doesn't quite fit. I'm going to keep the Earth at the center, and I'm going to explain things mathematically. And in fact, Ptolemy's model was so effective that years after people realized the Earth wasn't in the center of the universe, um, you still have navigators using Ptolemy's model because it, it was easier to think of the Earth in the center. And so when they're out on ships, they pretended the Earth was in the center of the solar system in order to better understand where they were because Ptolemy's model was simpler. Um, but again, you see this as storytelling, unmoved mover creating things. And Aristotle thought everything was perfect and put them in circles. And Ptolemy thought a little bit more mathematically. Um, but this is still telling a story to explain uh, reality. And then, of course, you have the Bible. Uh, the Bible enters the scene, and I'm skipping quite a few different stories. Obviously, I've just talked about polytheism and, and Greek philosophy. So there's an abundance of other stories out there. But just to highlight a few, uh, the Bible enters the scene, the Old Testament, of course, quite a while before Jesus enters the scene, and then the New Testament after the life of Jesus. Um, but the Bible is a little bit different, because instead of just being a story that explains how the sun goes up and down, um, you have a story that claims to be the ultimate story of reality. Uh, it claims to have the whole truth, right? It claims to have, it claims to record from the beginning of creation to now, how we got here, and uh, what comes next, right? It claims to have the whole thing. Uh, what's very interesting about the Bible in comparison to these other stories uh, that we see throughout history is that when the Old Testament comes down, which is what God gave to Moses on Mount Sinai, uh, the first five books of the Old Testament, Pentateuch, these are a direct contrast and a direct contradiction to the pagan mythologies that were around at the time. So it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The pagan gods were not really thought of to be these all-powerful creators, but rather uh, kind of glorified humans that fought and, as I said, fought, killed each other, fell in love, all these things. And so this was a direct contrast to that those pagan mythologies. It was, no, there is one God. He is creator of everything. And this is what he wants us to do, right? That's the Old Testament law. But then the New Testament comes along, uh, like I said, after the life of Christ. This is when the Greek philosophies were very popular. And so when, and for example, in John, when uh, John begins with, in the beginning was the word, the word uh, or logos in Greek is something that the Greeks would have been very familiar with. They thought of this unmoved mover type of thing. They thought of everything as being united through this divine word, this divine logos. So when he says in the beginning was the logos, all the Greeks would have nodded along and say, yes, we agree with that. Then he says, but this logos was God, right? And then they would go, oh. Um, so he's starting with something, John is, and of course John's right, and it can apply to us just as well as the Greeks, but it's something that the Greeks would have recognized and then, something for John to build off of uh, later and say, well, this thing that you know of already, this is God. So you have the Old Testament directly refuting these, these pagan mythologies, and you have the New Testament directly refuting um, the Greek philosophies of the New Testament, that uh, the Stoics and the, um, the hedonists and the people that, that Paul would have interacted with on his journeys in the New Testament. So what is interesting is that the Bible, by refuting all of these things, and then also by replacing um, these mythologies with something of substance, with, with a, a uh, universal um, meaning to life, right? They give, the scripture gives so much more of, of how the universe works and how God created everything in a rational and ordered way. And this is going to pave the way for a scientific revolution, right? And so science uh, enters the scene. This is a while after the, the New Testament, but um, it enters the scene on on the basically on the the bandwagon of Christian philosophy or Christian theology. Uh, the Christians are actually the ones who are going to inspire the scientific revolution. But uh, that does not mean that science is no longer storytelling. This is not some higher form of understanding reality. It is still at its fundamental point. Um, it is still telling a story. So when I got to present uh, some of my research at at a conference. Um, and under my professor, Dr. Blaschke, you had told me, he said, remember, don't ever forget. All you're doing is telling a story, right? You're telling a story of what you did and how you did it so that other scientists can look at it and they can see what you did and they can repeat it in a laboratory and they'll get kind of the same results that you do, right? So that's the point of, that's the point of science. You need to tell everyone what you did so they can do the same thing. Uh, and it's testable and repeatable. So science, modern science is still telling a story, just like the ancient pagans did uh, thousands of years ago. 
Uh, the difference is that science is recognizing that there is some objective truth or objective story that that reality actually is. And science is trying to find that. So you discard models that don't explain reality very well and you keep the models that do. So science is trying to discover which story corresponds to reality. Um, unfortunately, and this is where we get to creation evolution. This is where we get to the, the point here is that the story of modern science is not the story we find in the scripture. You do not have a six day creation. You don't have a 6,000 year old earth. And we'll explain why those things are, are in the scripture in a minute, but uh, you don't get the Genesis account from modern science. Modern science tells us that instead of a six day creation, you have a creation process that took billions and billions of years of unguided uh, processes that we can observe um, guiding evolution or the change of one creature into another creature that is going to explain how we got here today. We are descended from the ancestors that are, uh, that apes also share, right? We are primates, descendant of ape-like ancestors. Those ape-like ancestors descended from fish, right? You go all the way back to single-celled organisms billions of years ago, and all life, everything you see, um, from everybody in this room to every uh, tree out in the courtyard, is going to have a common ancestor. We're all related. And we descended with modification over billions of years. And that's how we come to uh, where we are today, which is completely different from the creation account we get in the Bible. Uh, applying this to space and the cosmology, you also have a, a completely different view. Instead of a six-day creation where God is creating and ordering things, you have a big explosion that happens where nothing becomes basically everything. And over billions and billions of years, um, planets and stars and uh, planetary systems are starting to form kind of on their own based on the laws of nature, the laws of gravity. And Stephen Hawking was a big proponent of this. He wasn't the only one. Um, Einstein did a lot of research in this. Uh, today, you have people like Lawrence Krauss, who just wrote a book a few years ago called The Universe from Nothing, proposing that nothing exploded and gave us everything that we have today. Um, so again, we see a fundamentally different vision of how we got here than the Bible gives us. And so that's 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 where we're at right now. Um, so as you can see, Stephen Hawking's two books I posted up there were called A Brief History of Time, and then he wrote a follow-up called A Briefer History of Time. And if you notice, my lecture here is called The Briefest History of Time, because I want to go back to what Scripture says. I want to go back to the Genesis account of a six-day creation that happened only 6,000 years ago, which is a very big difference between 6,000 years and 13.5 billion years. And so I'm kind of giving you the briefest history of time that we have. Um, and so, as I've said to a few of you, today's uh, lecture is going to be focused on creation, six-day creation, and why it has to be six days, um, with a bit of a focus on history, but I'll expand to Bible and maybe some of the science as well. Uh, the next presentation will be on the flood, which is really going to be focused on the science. Um, if you back up, scientifically speaking, you can only really get to the flood of Noah. We're not going to really, you can't really do any scientific uh, knowledge that's going to get us before the flood because the flood wiped everything out, right? Um, but the flood is going to explain so much for creationism. So if you're interested, the flood will be all the science of creationism. And then finally, the last lecture will be a focus on philosophy and maybe some um some science as well there, but it's going to be kind of now. How does creationism, like I said, how does creationism hold up in comparison to other philosophies, other views uh, that you'll find today? So that's the that's what the series is, and we'll get started with uh, our six-day creation. So again, with a focus on history, um, let's talk about uh, kind of my approach here. So I thought a lot about how the approach should be, and I realized um the more and more that I study this stuff, the more and more I realize that um, you really can't escape uh, without having all three of these things. And they're all present in the, in the beginning. Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Um, you see three things. There is a lot of philosophy in there. There's a lot of history in there. And there's a lot of science in there, right? And the more I, the more I study this again, the more I realize you can't do, you can't have this conversation um, well, you can't have it, you can't complete this conversation uh, without talking about at least one of these three things. Now, what's funny is that the the modern science story of things, the Big Bang and evolution, everything I just talked about, uh, those, the people pr proposing those are have pretty much just a focus on science, a little bit of history, mostly science. 
In fact, Stephen Hawking at the beginning of one of his books says that philosophy is dead. We shouldn't even think about philosophy anymore. Um, and so I fundamentally disagree with that, thinking more than science. And that's why this lecture is going to be a little more history focused. And then the last one will be philosophy focused because you need more than science to have this conversation. Uh, so that's my approach. I want science informed by history. Uh, you, in order to know which scientific ideas to accept or believe, you kind of also have to know how we got those scientific ideas. Uh, that actually has a bearing on whether or not you should believe them. Um, but I also think you need history with attention to philosophy. You need to know what philosophy is underlying uh, these ideas. And then finally, uh, you need philosophy supported by science because you can get a ton of history, you can get a ton of philosophy, but then if you're completely ignor ignoring the actual scientific evidence, then you're still doing it wrong. So that's my approach. I think you need all three of those things. And, um, and I'm going to get started with history. All right, so with history, with history, it kind of begins, um, at least the history of science, it begins with a question of why did science start in Europe, specifically medieval Europe? That's where we have to start. Uh, we have to start with where did science initially begin? Like I said, science with attention to history. Uh, and this is a question that both Christian and secular historians have had to wrestle with. And um, it might not seem obvious why this is an important question, but if you look at the historical context, there's a lot of reasons why science should have started elsewhere. Uh, ancient Babylon um, from thousands of years ago actually had superior mathematics. Uh, their mathematics was on point. They did, uh, they've did. they uncovered many archeological uh, digs uh, from Babylon of children being taught in mathematics. They, th they see things scribed on, uh, lots of scribes writing things on, on stone plates. Uh, and their mathematics were just incredibly, incredibly superior to other people's in that time. In fact, um, as I mentioned, when Ptolemy added mathematics to Aristotle's model of the solar system, uh, he only did that because during his lifetime, Alexander the Great uh, conquered the Babylonians and discovered all of these mathematics that the Babylonians had. So Ptolemy looked at that and said, I can apply this to Aristotle and basically put the two together to, to create his model. So Babylon had superior mathematics. Ancient Greece, as you've already talked about, had superior uh, or more intelligent philosophy. They've thought about the about the world and and all the parts of it for a long time. Um, they they've they're certainly more advanced in the realms of of thinking about reality and what is truth and and they founded uh, the study of formal logic that we still have today. That began with with the Greeks. Medieval China had better technology. Uh, for a long time, people thought Europe had the best technology. And then in the 1900s, some historians looked back and, and studied China and history of China and found out they had things like the compass and gunpowder and paper and all sorts of things before uh, Europe actually had any of those. Uh, so with Babylon having superior mathematics, Greece having a more intelligent philosophy and China having better technology, why is it that the scientific movement, uh, the scientific method, uh, modern science as we know it, why did it start in your medieval Europe? And the easiest, simplest answer is that medieval Europe had Christianity. Uh, it's because there were so many Christian thinkers in medieval Europe that this is where science came from. It's pretty clear to me uh, from the research I've done, and, and secular historians will admit this as well, that the scientific method emerged in Europe because the natural philosophers, who weren't called scientists yet, believe the story of scripture to be true. It's because they believe in the scripture that the scientific method arose. And here's why. Uh, you really had s several different doctrines uh, that inspired the scientific movement. Um, this is documented by several historians. Um, but the first was the doctrine of Imago Dei, the image of God. Uh, and this is largely dating back to Augustine, really. Augustine is going to be the biggest one whose theology helps inspire the scientific movement. Um, but from the Imago Dei, the Christians got the idea that the universe is naturally ordered and that by having the image of God, we humans can actually study and learn about nature. And um, this is significant. Not other, other religions did not have this. Other philosophies did not have this. This is unique to Christianity, that the universe had to be mathematically ordered Everything had to make sense and that our brains were capable of understanding it. But we weren't perfect, right? You also have peccatum originis, uh, which is original sin. You also have the fall. 
And this means that as, as fallen individuals, uh, as a fallen race, people uh, are prone to mistakes. They're prone to falling to their own uh, temptations, their own human nature, and they are imperfect. And from this idea, they got, well, we can, we can study nature and figure things out, but we're going to mess up so much because our human nature is going to put our pride and uh, our own vanity in front of, you know, the truth, the search for truth. We need a system uh, in which we can observe nature and check each other, right? Some higher standard that we can live up to that can guide our studies to avoid our sinful nature from tripping us up and getting the wrong conclusions. And this uh, became the scientific method. Right, the scientific method of observations, experimentations, um, and constructing models and theories. That whole scientific method is an extension of Augustine's theology, uh, and science and natural philosophers were convinced we needed it um, because of essentially th biblical theology. And then what's going to pop out all over the place, right around medieval Europe, is going to be this idea that we are by doing science, by studying nature, you are thinking God's thoughts after him. Uh, that's a quote from Johannes Kepler, who's some even credit as the first true scientist. Uh, I put it a little earlier with maybe Copernicus and Francis Bacon, but they're all some of the earliest scientists and they all had some sort of, uh, you can find it in all their writings. Um, they all uh, had, had some form of either talking about that God wrote two books the book of nature and the book of the Bible, right? You get natural uh, revelation and special revelation. Um, you'll see a lot of, you'll see a lot of scientists saying things like, you know, that you have to study nature in order to grow closer to God. It's an act of worship uh, is what some of them had said. So you, and you have that from the origins of, of biology with uh, John Ray, who had written a lot of books on uh, God and nature. You have um, the founder of chemistry uh, writing books about, about God and nature, you have uh, basically anywhere you look, any origin of science that you can find is going to have some, the first person who did it, did it because they believed that they were getting closer to understanding God. They were thinking God's thoughts after him. Uh, so from there, you get the justification of why you do science and also the motivation to do science. It was an act of worship. It was an act of gaining knowledge about God. And um, there's plenty of, there's there's plenty of writings to back that up. Um, from both theologians and from early scientists. Uh, so here we have Christianity and science being in harmony, which is not something you hear a lot in today, because again, everyone is so science focused. But if you take a peek at history, uh, throughout a lot of history, you're going to see science and Christianity in complete harmony. But we haven't really gotten to creationism yet. What about a six day creation? What about a 6,000 year old earth? Was there a six day creation controversy then? Were people doubting? the six days of creation. Uh, what, what do they believe about, about young earth creationism? Um, so the next question, the first one, why did science come out of medieval Europe? We answered that. Uh, next one, why was there a creation controversy in medieval Europe? And the answer was, it might surprise a lot of you, but yes, there was. There was a controversy concerning the six days of creation. Um, and so to take a look at that, uh, we'll have to go to not just the rise of Christianity, or sorry, not the, not the rise of science, but we'll have to go to the rise of Christianity. Uh, which I'm giving it a generous uh, amount of time there, but between zero and 1500 AD. Um, you'll see that as Christianity is arising, theology is becoming a discipline. So upon reading uh, theologians who are intently studying the word and trying to figure out what it says, uh, I'm frequently reminded of the Greeks who did the same thing. They were thinking about philosophy. They're getting in their own heads. And you can see they basically did the same approach that the Greeks did to philosophy, but to the Bible instead of just to, you know, their own, their own minds. They were studying scripture and trying to figure out what they say. So everyone is writing statements of faith or catechisms. Um, you'll see Rene Descartes locking himself in his room and saying, and blocking out everything in his mind and saying, what can I know for absolute certainty without seeking any other outward source, right? So these theologians are very similar to philosophers. Um, you see it with Thomas Aquinas in his Summa Theologia, where he is asking questions about the Bible and then he's answering the questions, and then he's objecting to his own answers, and then he's objecting to his own objections, right? And that's, that's the structure of that book. It's it's hard to figure out what he believes because he keeps objecting to himself, right? And it's because they didn't really know. They're, they're trying, they have this, this Bible uh, for the first time, right? This is early on in church history, and they're trying to figure out what does this actually say? What are we meant to believe in response to this Bible? 
Um, but you also have at the same time, the church at this time is going to be the Roman Catholic Church, right? Um, the Roman Catholic Church gets to power in, you know, late 1000 AD, uh, roughly. And the Roman Catholic Church has a problem. And this problem is that they do not believe, uh, view the scripture as the sole authority. They believe the Pope has the sole authority over the church, right? And this is what's going to spur the conflict of the Reformation. So you have to recognize that. You have to recognize that they're looking at theology and the way the Greeks looked at philosophy. And you also looked at the, look at the fact that the church did not really view scripture as the be-all and end-all of, of authority. And so, how do they view six-day creation? Well, uh, not as a six-day creation, actually. Um, St. Augustine, who I keep bringing up, again, monumental and inspiring the scientific revolution. Um, but before the Reformation, he denied a, uh, he was before the Reformation, he died before, before the Reformation. Um, but he believed that uh, the universe was not created in six days. And many others followed like him. They abandoned biblical literalism. And this is something creationists don't often realize, is that it's not just Darwin that caused people to leave a six-day creation. People have been leaving a six-day creation since the very beginning. Uh, and a lot of people did. They followed Augustine's lead, and they, they assumed that the six days were not 24 hours. Um, instead, he believes that it happened all at once. All right, so creation happened in one instant, and the six days is kind of a way that he ordered them. He kind of put everything into a six-day order, in the way that God told Moses. Uh, and following his lead, you have a lot of theologians. Uh, Anselm of Canterbury was another one um, that believed that God created in a single instant and not in six 24-hour days. Um, Thomas Aquinas, and as I already said, the Summa Theologia, um, I did a lot of reading from that one. Uh, he says, further, according to Augustine, the things which we read of as being made in six days were made together at one time. And so all the six days must have existed at the beginning of creation. Um, so six days were not six days. It was all at once. In fact, all the way back at uh, about 200 AD with the theologian Origen, he even goes so far as to say, what person of any intelligence would think that there existed a first, second, and third day and evening and morning without sun, moon, and stars? So he's saying it's pretty obvious, right? You have to be a fool to say it's an actual six 24-hour days. And considering he came uh, 1,500 years before Darwin, the earth creationists read that and they go, ouch, right? Someone called us a fool all the way back in 200 AD. So what's going on here? Why is six-day creation being, a, being abandoned when they don't even have science yet? They don't even have Darwin. They don't even have the Big Bang. They're not even, there's no pressure on them to abandon six days creation. Like, what's going on? Do, are, are we completely in the wrong? Is the earth creationist? Uh, are we completely wrong? Well, there are a few caveats here. There are some things uh, that you have to recognize about these theologians and why they are abandoning uh, six-day creation. And for one, as an earth creationist, these theologians still affirmed a 6,000-year-old earth. So they didn't, change, they didn't change the time of creation. They just changed how long it took for God to do the creating. Um, so they were young earth creationists, right? They're on, they're on our side. Um, and those were based on 6,000 years actually comes from the Bishop James Usher, who the 6,000 years comes from. He took all the genealogies in the Bible from Adam to Abraham to David to Jesus and we know when Jesus was, so you can kind of add up all those dates, and you end up with 6,000 years. So that's why young earth creationists say 6,000 years. Uh, we can place Adam there confidently in the timeline of 6,000 years ago. So they were still young earth creationists. Second, uh, you do have to recognize, obviously, that they're not expanding the days to millions and millions of years. They are shortening the days. They're going the other direction than people do today. But finally, the most important part, is you also have to recognize the deep, deep influence Aristotle had on the Christians in medieval Europe. So once again, with Aristotle's model, he believed in a prime mover that created everything all at once in a perfect system of perfect circles and everything was perfect, right? And his model, even though Ptolemy modifies it, his model, Christians very easily took and said, this is pretty easy, perfect circles. Why wouldn't the God of the Bible make things in perfect circles? Unmoved mover, that sounds just like the God of the Bible. And so they took Aristotle's model and they Christianized it. 
Um, but in the process, they realize an unmoved mover creating everything at once doesn't quite fit with the six day creation. So the six days must all be in one instant. And they might not have wrote, written that out. They might not have said, according to Aristotle, right? Thomas Aquinas did, said, according to Augustine, not according to Aristotle. But you do have to recognize that this model that Aristotle built was, was accepted uh, without any pushback for over a thousand years. So it's definitely going to have an impact on how these theologians um, read the scriptures, right? They already have that model in their minds. So they are definitely heavily influenced by Greek philosophy. All right. So, but after this, then um, you do hit the Reformation about 1500 AD. So all that, these theologians abandoned six day creation, but then the Catholic church keeps uh, irritating people, especially this guy named Martin Luther. And you have the Reformation in about 1500 AD. Um, so we're not going to go dive too deeply into the Protestant Reformation in terms of Catholic versus Protestant, but we are going to keep track of these, how people view the six-day creation. Um, so it obviously challenged most of the doctrines of Catholicism, the ones that they added onto Scripture. Um, but importantly, Luther, you may know, proposed the idea of sola scriptura, which means the Scripture is the sole authority, right? Only Scripture. So we must trust Scripture above all else including, it would seem, Aristotle. So Martin Luther says, kick out Aristotle, kick out Ptolemy, because it does not match with the scripture. Uh, and so Martin Luther leading the way, but most of the reformers, because they can read the scripture for themselves now, and they love the scripture and they think it's a sole authority, are going to move everything back to a six-day creation. And in fact, Martin Luther said, this is a great quote, he wrote, when Moses writes that God created heaven and earth and whatever is in them in six days, then let this period continue to have been six days and do not venture to devise any comment according to which six days were one day. But if you cannot understand how this could have been done in six days, then grant the Holy Spirit the honor of being more learned than you are. For you are to deal with scripture in such a way that you bear in mind that God himself says what is written. But since God is speaking, it is not fitting for you wantonly to turn his word in the direction you wish it to go. Uh, I don't think he could have been any more firmer with that, uh, with that speech there. Um, so again, Martin Luther points us back to the scripture and says, whatever the scripture says goes and whatever, anything else that is influencing your view of scripture, you need to kick it out. Um, so a couple of things to note before I move on from the reformation, again, strong six day creationists, you do have non-literal views not dying out. There are some people, again, Aristotle had a big influence and, and so did Augustine and so did Thomas Aquinas. So non-literal views did not die out. John Wesley wrote, uh, scriptures were written not to gratify our curiosity, but to lead us to God. He did not believe in the six days. But at the same time, it is clear through from historically speaking, that theology that affirms scripture as the ultimate authority, right? Any theology that says scripture is the ultimate authority, generally speaking, aligns with a literal six-day creation view, right? So anytime we leave that six-day creation view, uh, it tends to be because there is an external influence on us. And this can be true because, generally speaking, people return to six-day creation all the way up for a few hundred years until uh, basically the age of Darwin. Now, another misconception here is that people moved away from young earth creationism with Darwin. They actually moved away from it a little bit earlier. There was a lot of, of people talking about the earth being older before Darwin comes onto the scene. Most notably, Charles Lyell. Uh, in 1830, he published a book, Principles of Geology, in which he proposed that the geological column that we see, all the layers of rock, uh, were laid down over millions of years, each one, and says that the Bible, he actually would have called out the Bible and said, earth cannot be 6,000 years, it has to be much older. So you do have another misconception there. People think Darwin turned everyone old earth. But Darwin actually read this book, Principles of Geology, while he was on his famous voyage on the Beagle and actually inspired him to think, well, if the earth is very, very old, um, what does that have to say about the animals and the life and, and plant life and all that? And actually pushes him in the direction of evolution. But then, of course, uh, Lyle did not have nearly as much of an impact as Darwin had when he published The Origin of Species, which proposed, as I said, that we are all related to um, every single species of life um, from billions and billions of years back, and that we descended with modification uh, through natural selection 
um, from single celled organisms and that this process is natural and unguided. All right. He specifically made a point to say these are unguided processes and that God is not necessary to make this happen. His great legacy, if you ask most people, his legacy would be explaining the apparent design in nature without calling on the need for a designer. And that's what that's his legacy today. Natural selection is up there, too. It's like natural selection and design without a designer are going to be the two things he's most known for. Um, so because of them, scientists shift towards an old universe, um, rejecting, again, Usher's 6,000-year-old universe. And then you're going to have some people who say, okay, well, the Earth is billions of years old. And they start to look at the sky. They start to look at the planets. And you get the Big Bang Theory, uh, which says everything started billions of years ago with a big explosion, again, from pretty much from nothing or from a particle or depending on who you talk to. The uh, universe exploded into existence billions of years ago. And that's how you get Stephen Hawking's A Brief History of Time. Uh, again, Lawrence Krauss's A Universe from Nothing, more Hawking books, um, abundance, abundance of literature out there on the Big Bang Theory. Neil deGrasse Tyson does a lot on it. Christians like Hugh Ross are big proponents of the Big Bang. Uh, you're going to see a lot, a lot of Big Bang cosmology. Um, so here again, we're going to see um, a lot of Christians leaving a literal six-day creation view behind in light of these scientific discoveries. So just as Aristotle influenced a lot of Christians uh, away from six days, you're going to see people like B.B. Warfield, Carl Barth, even C.S. Lewis and Billy Graham, Chuck Colson, Francis Collins, Lee Strobel, William Lane Craig, and abundance of other Christians uh, abandoning a literal six-day, 6,000 year, years ago view and accepting, um, not all of these accept evolution, but they do accept Big Bang cosmology and a very old, uh, old Earth, old universe. Um, the Catholic Church is probably the most influenced by this. Uh, Protestants are going to be pretty split, depending on who you talk to. Um, but Catholic, Catholicism has, in general, stood with evolution. They've accepted it. The last few popes uh, have st have made statements uh, supporting it, uh, especially Pope Benedict and Pope Francis. Pope Francis said the Big Bang does not contradict the divine act of creating, but rather requires it. So he says, yes, the universe exploded out of nothing, but it's because God created the universe out of nothing, which is... An, an attractive view. Uh, and then he says the evolution of nature does not contrast with the notion of creation as evolution presupposes the creation of beings that evolve. So he's saying evolution, big bang fit right in. Um, so my question I have to ask is, do we need another creation reformation? Uh, do we need to repeat history in the same way? Just as people started to leave six day creation and then came back with the reformation. Now people are starting to leave it again. And in neither cases did six-day creation die out entirely, but we're seeing a, a these massive trends. So do we need a new reformation that brings us back to a 6,000-year-old, uh, six-literal-day creation? And you can already anticipate my proposition is going to be yes, we do. Um, I think that we need to remember that a six-day creation is only abandoned when, ex when external authorities influence biblical exegesis. So whether that's the Greek philosophers or modern science, Whatever it is, we only leave, historically speaking, we only leave a six-day creation when external resources or influences are pushing us in that way. I think we need to return to Luther's reverence for scripture, even when it contradicts modern uh, mainstream scientific theories. So I'm with Luther. If there's something else telling you that something is a different way, but the scripture says otherwise, go with the scripture. And finally, we need to recognize that reinterpreting Genesis often undermines some biblical doctrine. And it is to that point that I'm going to turn to next. And I'll give you guys a few reasons why um, few reasons why abandoning a six-day view of Genesis is going to cause a lot of theological problems down the road. And then from there on, I'll be happy to take any questions. So I have four reasons. Um, and with a little bit of tweaking, I managed to get all four of them to begin with the letter O. Uh, so uh, we have the other parts of scripture besides Genesis. You have the order of creation, the origin of death and suffering, and the ontology of man. So walk through each of these four really quick and then uh, try and wrap up on time here. Uh, so firstly, let's take a sip of water first, actually. <laughs> firstly, you have other parts of scripture. So this is probably the first place you should go to if you're curious about uh, how to interpret Genesis, is that really the creation account is mentioned in more places than just Genesis 1. Um, in Exodus, for instance, God repeats his creation account 
and actually says that it is a sign for his people that he created the earth in six days, which I find stronger language. If he just repeats it and says, you know, six days, Lord created, but he goes further than that and says that those six days are a sign in the same way a rainbow, for instance, is a sign to Noah that he'll never flood the earth again. This seems to me that when he says this, he means it. You can find that first in Exodus 20. This is when he's giving his 10 commandments. And this is his support for why we must rest on the seventh day. His support is that uh, for in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So this is a response to a frequent claim among old earth uh, creationists or, or theistic evolutionists uh, that say that Genesis 1 through 3 is written far more poetically than the rest of Genesis is. Uh, and they'll look to the Hebrew and they'll look to the scriptures and they'll say there's a lot of poetry there, right? Making man from the dust of the ground. Um, you have God separating the water from the water. He's using very poetic language here. And so we can interpret that as, as poetry. And then after Genesis 3, everything else can be interpreted as history. Well, if everything from that point on is interpreted as history, why does God, in his historical account, repeat a six-day creation view? Um, it doesn't make sense. So you can't just you can't just interpret the first three chapters as poetry when those same three chapters are referenced in a historical context later on in the Old Testament. Uh, he says this again, Exodus 31, and here comes the language I was referring to, where he says, it is a sign between me and the sons of Israel forever. This is why most Jewish biblical scholars are also six-day creationists. It is a sign between me and the sons of Israel forever. For in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth. But on the seventh day, he ceased from labor and was refreshed. Um, so it's not just, he's not just kind of referencing Genesis. It's not a little uh, wink towards Moses and saying, yay, I remember what I said that. This is a sign to his people that is going to seal his end of the bargain here, right? His end of the covenant is sealed with the Sabbath day because in six days he created. So for six days we shall work. Um, so there you have it. In Exodus, God repeats a six day creation account. I think it's also significant that for Genesis and Exodus, this isn't just a someone with the Holy Spirit writing as it is in the rest of the books of the Bible, but we believe that the first five books of the Bible are the words of God spoken down to Moses on the mountain, right? And it's hard for me to accept that God would tell Moses something that is simply not uh, accurate to reality. I don't see how God could tell Moses and the people I created in six days if he created in one instant or if he created over millions and millions of years. Um, so next, we can even move to the New Testament. In Mark chapter 10, Jesus states that mankind has been on earth since the beginning of creation. Now, if you think about that for a second... Evolution has billions and billions of years of death and destruction and evolution and creatures changing and other creatures. And um, they'll place the origin of man, depending on who you talk to. Uh, most evolutionists will put mankind entering the scene about 200,000 years ago. So if you take a 13.5 billion year history, and then you put man uh, 200,000 years ago, that's going to put man at the very, very, very end, the very sliver of human history on the span of billions of year history. But God says from the beginning of creation, not from the end of creation, was man and woman created. And uh, it seems to me here that just reading this at face value, that's what he's saying. Some could argue he means from the creation of humans, right? From the beginning of human creation. But there's no caveat. There's no clarification there. It is simply from the beginning of creation. And uh, it seems to me that the pattern of scripture that Genesis would have us believe, uh, and, and Jesus here would have us believe, is that man has been here from the beginning, right? We are his image bearers. We are his masterpiece, you might say. We are his 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 proudest achievement is creating man uh, in, in terms of the creation account. And so it seems more theologically sound to place man at the beginning of creation. Uh, I mean, end of the creative process, but beginning of our, our history, uh, then rather just a more of a universe's afterthought, right? The tiny blip at the end of the universe's history. Um, I don't see that as being compatible at all. Um, so there is other parts of scripture. Uh, and there it is. From the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. And he even uses this. Again, he's not just saying this out of context. He didn't just say, I made the earth in six days out of context. Then he was talking about the Ten Commandments and honoring the Sabbath. Here he's talking about uh, the reason for marriage. 
that I created marriage sacred for a, a man and a woman from the very beginning of creation. It was like this. It's been the plan the whole time to have a man and a woman and the man leaves and cleaves to his wife, right? This is the language he uses uh, to describe marriage. And to justify his description of marriage, he says, this is the plan from the beginning of creation, not the tiny bit at the end of creation, the beginning of creation. All right, second one is this one I really think is not talked about enough. And I'd like to see more theistic evolutionists explain this one to me. Because the order of creation that God presents is in Genesis is completely different from the order in which creatures evolve according to evolution. Um, so as you can see here, this is kind of the order of uh, evolution. You're going to get sea creatures first before they evolve onto land in the form of amphibians and then uh, land creatures. And then finally, you're going to get birds and modern mammals at the very, very end. Um, it doesn't look like too much contradiction here. You go, well, the sea creatures at the beginning. So that's a start, right? Um, but the more you look at it, the more you can see the, the discrepancies here. So in Genesis, you read that birds came before reptiles, right? Birds are day five. Reptiles would have been creeping creatures that, you know, walk along the land. They're going to be day six. Um, you also see the earth before the sun and stars, which is horribly counterintuitive to someone who's trying to get the earth without some divine interference. Uh, you need some natural processes. You're going to need the sun there. You're going to need all the other planets there. You're going to need the stars there all before you get an earth compatible with life. Um, but no, God created the earth first and sustained it and then put everything else around it. And then as a little less significant, but still a contradiction, you also have marine mammals before land mammals. So God did not say fish on day five. He said creatures of the sea in day five. So most of us uh, would interpret that to mean that whales, um, seals, any marine uh, mammal or reptile, you can put reptile on there too, would have been created on day five, and then the land mammals created on day six. Well, the order uh, that evolution presents to us is going to be completely different from that. They're going to say, no, 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 reptiles evolved into birds. You have reptiles before birds. Uh, they're going to say, of course, you need the sun and stars before the earth, because without the sun, how are you going to sustain the earth? What's it going to revolve around, right? You need the sun there before you get the earth there. And then they actually do believe creatures evolved onto land and then some of the mammals evolved back into the sea to become whales and seals and sea lions. So they're going to put land mammals before sea mammals on the in the um, in the timeline. Um, so there you can see order of creation. And to me, this seems like Genesis is rather deliberately contradicting the th modern theories pertain to cosmology, uh, which is like the Big Bang, geology, and they call. Uh, uh, that uniformitarianism is the, kind of the secular explanation of geology that began with Charles Lyell in his book that I mentioned earlier. And biology, evolution. He seen, Genesis seems to go out of its way to mix things up in the order of creation in order to contradict all three of these areas of modern science. Um, and so the point here, the point here is really, this doesn't, this doesn't really refute anything, but the point is, that um, extending the length of the creation days, as the day age view suggests, or adding millions of years in between each of the days is not going to solve anything. You can't just say the days were longer and then everything fits together like a puzzle piece, right? You actually have to interpret, and the, the serious theistic evolutionists will actually do this. They basically have to say that all the whole entire Genesis creation account is a complete metaphor, or it is completely poetic, or that none of it is really corresponding to reality it's just, you know, the way God decided to tell us about biblical truths, like God created the world or that mankind is, is special above all the other animals, right? So they have to interpret the whole thing as poetic. And that's a much bigger step than to say, well, what if the days were really long? If, if, the, if that would fix things, you know, let's hear it. Let's hear the reasons why the days were more than, were more than 24 hours. But if the order is all out of whack, um, I don't understand you know, why does the length of days matter when you still have all these other incompatibilities? It is, as Henry Drummond says in the play Inherit the Wind, that's a movie and a play. I highly recommend checking out both, though they're, you're, they will make you angry. Um, but this is a, he is a lawyer here defending a teacher um, who taught evolution in school and then got sued for it. And it's a very pro-evolution court drama. But Henry Drummond says in the play, Darwin took us forward to a hilltop from where we could look back and see the way from which we came. But for this insight and for this knowledge, 
we must abandon the pleasant poetry of Genesis. All right, that's what's at stake here. It's not extending the days. It's not closing one eye and being like, oh, it fits together. It's about abandoning the entire Genesis uh, creation account, the first three chapters. You cannot really maintain consistency between modern science and Genesis one through three. You have to kind of abandon one or the other. Um, so again, something that I'd, I'd like to see more Christians uh, address if they're going to abandon a six-day view, you can't just add a bunch of time. All right, next, uh, I'm actually going to turn it over to an atheist here, Christopher Hitchens, uh, the a really, really brilliant man who had plenty of uh, really good debates uh, in his time, but hardcore atheist. And um, he is famous for, not really famous, but he's, there's a plenty of videos out there you can find of him addressing why he can't believe in a god. And you'll notice he has already accepted evolution. And so as an evolutionist, he has a hard time accepting God because of all this, the death and suffering that must happen before God's ultimate plan comes about. So I'll turn it over to him. He says, uh, in imagining this theistic evolutionary scenario, he says, uh, and this is all very sound and valid uh, evolutionary theory. This isn't him exaggerating anything. This is what the theory of evolution says. For at least 70,000 years, so I said 200,000, so again, depending on who you talk to, when, when humans enter the scene, he says, for at least 70,000 years, heaven watches as the human species is born and dies, usually of its teeth, usually at about 20 years old, usually with infants, having about a 9, 10, 2% chance of living, and heaven watches this with indifference, thousands and thousands of generations, miserable, illiterate, starving, and hungry. This is human origins, according to evolution, right? We are the lucky ones born in this generation. If we were born 70,000 years ago, most of us would have died a long time ago from our teeth because our teeth are still ape-like and not developed. The transition is a painful one, and it's full of suffering. And Christopher Hitchens can't believe in a God because how can a God look down at thousands and thousands of primitive humans dying from teeth problems, dying premature deaths, dying as children and babies, and only a few surviving? All because eventually he's going to, you know, he has a plan eventually. Um, he just can't believe that. And frankly, I can't either. But uh, instead of discarding the Genesis account as he does, I feel more inclined to stick with the Genesis account and discard his, his philosophical and um, scientific worldview. Um, so again, evolution is full of suffering, premature death, and disease. Um but rather, Scripture has a completely different thing, a different account of how disease and sin and suffering and death came into the world. Um, because according to Genesis, God created creation good. In fact, he even says in verse 31 of Genesis 1 that it was very good. Right. So his uh, his his creation that he created, we know was good. It wasn't thousands of primitive humans dying prematurely. It was good. Um, and then you even have in Romans, so I'm using Old and New Testament here. In Romans, it says, as by one man, sin entered the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men for all have sinned. And then he says, death reigned from Adam to Moses. So death does not enter the scene until after the fall of man, after the sin of man. Um, so again, as I have up there, death before sin is an essential component to evolution. And honestly, they wouldn't even use the word sin. But from a theistic evolutionary standpoint, death before sin is an essential component. Whereas in the scriptures, death because of sin or death after sin is an essential component of Christian doctrine, as Paul talks about in Romans. So another complete incompatibility there. Uh, and I should point out before anyone gets, you know, there, there are uh, lots of old earth creationists who get mad at me right now and say, well, there are plenty of old earth creationists. Uh, who don't believe in the evolution of man. Uh, and I, I want to recognize that those exist. Um, for right now, these are incompatibilities between modern scientific thinking and scripture that I'm focusing on. But I don't want to falsely put people into one or two camps because then people get angry. Um, fourth, and finally, we're almost there, guys. Um, we have the origin of mankind. Um, scripture is clear here that uh, man is a special creation of God, right? Not an, an evolved species that came from some pre-existing living thing. Um, evolutionary, and then second, I want to point out here with the origin of mankind, that evolutionary explanations, accepting any sort of evolutionary explanation for the origin of man, uh, you're always going to 
have an erosion of biblical doctrine. And I'll show you why. Um, Firstly, a quote from John Lennox, who, not a young earth creationist, but a very, very great um, Christian mathematician and scientist um, who does not believe in evolution. So he'd, again, fall in one of those outside camps that says evolution didn't happen, but the universe is old. Uh, but he has a great point on this. He says in his book, Seven Days That, that Divide the World, uh, in saying that God made man out of the dust of the ground, Genesis seems to be going out of its way to imply a direct special creation act, rather than suggesting that humans arose either by natural processes or by God's special activity out of pre-existing hominids. Hominids meaning uh, humanoid species, species that are like humans. So his point here is that if scripture wanted to say that we came from other life forms, other species, it easily could have said that, uh, or at least in the poetic nature of Genesis, implied a creation out of some pre-existing material. Um but it specifically says God made, he came down, right? So in, in our vision of Genesis, you have, he speaks and there are birds. He speaks and there are creatures of the sea. He speaks and there are land animals. Then he gathers dust from the ground and creates mankind apart from all other things. He is separating man from the rest of creation. Whereas evolution by definition must unite humans and say we came from those creatures he created beforehand. But that direct separation, regardless of whether or not you interpret Genesis as poetry or history, um, if you're going to say that man came from a pre-existing form or evolved from some ape-like ancestor, you are directly going against um, specific things that God put into scripture, um, a separation uh, of man from the rest of creation. And so that's the first point, is, is that you need, you need a special creation of man. Our second point is once you leave the special creation of man, you get some pretty major theological problems. Um, oh, and then I have this really quickly. The genealogy of Jesus Christ also refers to Adam in Luke, refers to Adam as Adam, the son of God, not the son of another human being or the son of uh, a monkey, right? This is the son of God. Um, so I do have that. That is an important point because... There are plenty of people who believe Adam came from a group of humans at the beginning. He wasn't the first, first man. He was just one man that God selected. And again, this goes against what we see in scripture. Um, okay, so here we have. Um, yeah, I'll skip over that. Okay. Um, you also have the erosion of biblical doctrine here. So Daniel C. Harlow and plenty of others, there's Denis Lamoro, you're going to see um, plenty of other uh, Christian philosophers and scientists, are actually going to say that uh, evolutionary biology is the reason we have sin. Um, and he says this right here. He says evolutionary biology gives us a better explanation than Augustine did of why all humans are united in sin. Not because we bear the guilt and fractured will of a single ancestral couple, who fell from a state of original righteousness, as it literally says in Genesis, but because we share a transtemporal and universal biological and cultural heritage that predisposes us to sin. So in essence, it's not because Adam sinned that all of us sin. It's because we are biologically inheriting a state of sin from creatures that lived before us, right? So sin has been in the world the whole time. Um, it was in the world when humans entered the scene, and we only sin because we are biologically programmed to. He says this predisposition to sin is a biologically inherited state, a byproduct, not of sin, but of billions of years of evolution. Uh, and I, I think I can see from your faces, this is directly contradicting things you've accepted of scripture already, right? This is starting to, this is starting to infringe upon um, basic fundamental uh, theology of, of Christianity, the story of Christianity where Jesus must come down to save us from our own sin, not from our own biology. Uh, and see John Collins, who's one of the leading Christian uh, uh, theologians in terms of origin of man. Um, he does a lot of, of work in that. Uh, has some great books out there. But he says in response, this is him actually responding to Harlow, uh, to the last quote. He says, if we deny that all people have a common source that was originally good, but through which sin came into the world, then the existence of sin becomes God's fault, not man's, uh, or even something that God could not avoid. In either case, there is little reason to be confident that relief is headed our way. Um, in short, you can't escape your own sin, not because of your spiritual self, but because of your biological self, because you've inherited that sin from previous species that you used to be, 
And there is no hope for you until Christ can come and revert us back and rise us above our own evolutionary history. Uh, again, none of that can be seen in scripture. Um, none of that is biblically founded. And a lot of it contradicts the whole purpose of why Jesus came down to save us. So the issue of, of a six day creation and the origin of man is bigger than just arguing about semantics or arguing about the origin of the world. Uh, it does have an impact on our theology. And again, not all theistic evolutionists say this, not all old earth creationists say this, but it is, it is something people take to its logical conclusions. And it's what a lot of Christians in academia are starting to think uh, along these lines. Um, and in contradiction to really this view, I wanted to throw this up here, uh, which is scripture from 1 Corinthians. Um, he says, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must be put must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall he be brought to pass, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So 1 Corinthians doesn't seem to have much to say on the origin, but I do want to ask in closing, is sin a necessary evil that God programmed into creation? And are we fighting, are we in a fight against spiritual evil or physical biology? And is our labor in vain? And I want to propose that we are not fighting our own biology. Uh, we are not fighting our own evolutionary past. But because we are fighting a spiritual battle, and because God is on our side in that spiritual battle, that spiritual death will be conquered, and that our labor in fighting against that those spiritual powers is not in vain, that we can overcome it, uh, that Christ has already overcome it for us, and that uh, labeling sin and some bi biologically inherited state, uh, I would say is completely contradictory to this passage in Corinthians and the patterns that scripture has for us um, overall. So finally, uh, to conclude, as a review, history indicates that a six-day creation is only abandoned when external influences affect our biblical interpretation. Uh, I wanted to propose that current scientific explanations, while very convincing, are incompatible with a historical interpretation of Genesis, and that abandoning these, this historical interpretation erodes our foundational biblical doctrines. And so I say, stick with scripture, push away those external influences, um, and, and honestly, move on. Um, but what about the scientific evidence against the biblical account? What do we do about all the science that we have here that, that says that the earth is old and that humans did evolve from, from primates? How do creationists explain the abundant fossils and genetics and data that support an ancient universe and universal common ancestry that we're all related? Um, that is the topic of my next lecture on April 9th, uh, 2024. So um, thank you for your attention and getting this far, and I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, JJ. So you said earlier that the flood kind of wiped out anything of scientific and historical we can see about before the flood. Do you think that that has could be a really, really relatable at all to the Fermi paradox theory? To the what? Fermi paradox. Who enlightened me? The Fermi paradox that one, the, I, I forget his name, I think it was like Fermi or something who who said that there that evolutionary there is a certain boundary that has to be crossed for intelligent life to begin or a, that we have uh, already passed and don't know or one in the future that could completely wipe out a civilizations and that's why we don't see any civilizations out in the universe yeah well uh, so or, original life i'm not super familiar with that paradox but um original life research is something that uh creationists aren't really doing um because to figure out how life kind of originated we kind of count that as a miracle that god did that scripture and John Lennox will say this as well. Scripture kind of says that getting life has to be a divine act. It's not something that can just be created. Right now, there's a whole there's a whole field of biology um, 
called abiogenesis, which is studying how life could have arose or evolved. Um, but in terms of evidence before, so the flood is really all the science that creationists have to explain things or, or defend themselves. Any apologetic use of science that we have is going to relate to the flood. Um, we can, and it, it goes to anything because it didn't just, the flood didn't just wipe out everything on earth. It also wiped out all the people down to just one family. So even if you start to study genetics or populations or um, you're going to study the geological column, you can, whatever it is we can study, it's all going to go back to the flood. Anything before the flood, um, you might argue we have some pre-flood fossils. Some might argue we have some pre-flood artifacts, but for the most part, um, creation science is going to stop at the, uh, any evidence we can find is going to stop at the flood because the flood wiped out everything and narrowed us down to one family. Um, and so you can do a lot of science about the flood and you can do a lot of studies like that. But before the flood, there's not really much we can do because it, it all got wiped out. Right. Um, so that's just we can postulate how the pre-flood world was, um, but we can't we can't really there's not much that we can get our hands on that that was before the flood for for the creationist. Before the flood, it's what we're actually driving in our cars. Before, before, before the, the flood, it's what we actually use to drive our cars. Oh, yes. And the, coal, the fossil fuels. Yeah. And the coal. And there's more coal now in the ground than there is biomass to make. Yeah, yeah. We have uh, a lot of uh, our fossil fuels, our coal, a lot of that is going to be deposited during the flood and it's going to stay there. And um, actually a lot to get into a little, so we, we do talk a little bit about science today. The um, fossil fuels is is actually, as you said, evidence of a of a young earth. So when we actually go down and get those fossils and, and that coal, there's bacteria that underground that is eating away at our fossil fuels. And um, so if the, those fossil fuels have been there for billions of years, it, it would all be gone by now. So it's kind of a mystery why we have enough fossil fuels to, to drive our cars. But yeah, a lot of that would have been also positive. Also the amount of pressure. Yeah pressure builds up and over a certain number of years, if it was millions of years, it would have already exploded yes. completely. Yeah. So it hasn't ended up. As it hasn't years. yet, yeah. Which is more evidence of young earth. Mm -hmm. I'm open to questions about science or fly. It doesn't have to just be on the history stuff or, or whatever we talked about. I'm open to other things. So I don't know if you want to check if there's questions on the... Um Mr. Ramgren, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Um, Abby G has a question. She said, you mentioned that it is fairly certain that the earth is 6,000 years old. How was this determined? I have always heard it was in the range of six to 10,000 years with no way of being certain. Okay. Yeah. So 6,000 is going to be what you're going to hear the most often. And again, that dates back to our Bishop uh, James Usher's uh, calculations. As I said, he counted up the genealogies. Um, why you might see six to 10,000 is because there have been people who look back and said, well, those genealogies, um, old geologies, they, they have also been known to skip generations. So they might say, you know, this person's son of this person, but they really mean son of this person, this person, this person, this person, and then this person. And so you can, it's potential, there's potential that there is, they're skipping generations and going to great grandfathers or great, great, great grandfathers instead of just fathers. And so there's there's the potential to expand that out to beyond 6,000 years and maybe even to 10,000 years because their lifespans were very, very long back then. Um, but it's it's not going to get you millions of years um, because that would be a lot of generations skipping. Um, but but there is some there is some flexibility there. But I, I tend to use 6,000 years. I, I, I don't see any reason to assume that there were generations skipped, but there's certainly the potential to get to 10,000 years. Yeah, JJ. Well, I remember earlier in the school year when you said a couple things about like humanity altering slightly and different and different human skeletons that evolution evolutionists say were ancient monkeys, and but you and that you say is actually more human and just slightly different. 
Yeah. So uh, human human uh, species is going to be a tricky. That's actually one of the hot topics in creation research is how many when you get a fossil, some fossils look very human, some fossils look kind of ape-like, and there's there's some controversy there. Um, but I think I was referring to then was a recent find uh, a couple years ago of a, uh, it was in Africa. They found a, um, basically a cave underground that was very, very difficult to climb into. And they found lots of human-like fossils buried under there that looked like intentional burial. They found evidence of fire and cave drawings. But these skeletons were, um, at least conventionally, the way they presented it, were that the skeletons were very ape-like, the species they called Homo naledi. And they are our distant cousins, and they had fire, and they they bury their dead, which is like very, very um, uh, in, in shattering for, for uh, um, anthropologists uh, to know. And so creationists are going to have different views on that. There's a lot of different species. There's Homo naledi, Homo erectus, um, Homo neanderthalensis. There's plenty of different human species, and creationists will disagree on which ones are real humans and which ones were not. Um, and it's 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 a hot topic that a lot of people are uncomfortable talking about because you don't want to think about the fact that there might have been like different species of humans that look kind of different from us. But um, but creationists will say even if there are different variations or fossils that look different from us, we all did descend from Adam and Eve, um, and so we're all one we're one race, one one kind. It's just that some fossils looked a little different, and we use things like evidence of fire and evidence of cave paintings as more of an indicator of whether they're human or not than we do with their fossils. Because the fossils can look very human and very ape-like at the same time. We actually have very similar skeletons to, to a lot of apes. So they use those indicators to say, oh, if it's making cave paintings, monkeys don't do that, right? And so they'll try to argue those are human. The, yeah, the genetic potential to genetic diversify. Potential. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be just like dog variations. So you get you get chimpanzees and you get, you know, not chimpanzees, chihuahuas. You get chihuahuas, you get a Great Danes, you get all sorts of different kinds of dogs, but they all come from an ancestral pair of dogs. Um, and so the same idea, you have two humans that, that come out of the ark or a family of humans come out of the ark. And as they diversify, you're going to get skeletons and races of humans that, that look very different, but we're all image bearers. We all come from Noah. We all come from Adam and Eve. Um, so, but, but yeah, that's the, we just creationists can't creationists. Uh, we talk about them, like they all get along, but they really don't. They're going to disagree about a lot of those things too. Yeah, Pastor Rob. Yeah, uh, Jake. Um, one argument that I sometimes hear from theistic evolutionists, and I don't agree with it, but I'm just curious how you would answer sure. it. Um, you know, as they'll say, if we do believe that God has spoken to us both in the Book of Nature and in the Bible, mm -hmm. um, and if it seems that the Book of Nature is telling us one thing about the you know the origin of this universe or the age of the universe or that kind of thing, should that not impact the way that we then would read the bible if we believe that god has spoken both in general and special revelation mm -hmm. and so that's a, an argument kind of that i will commonly hear and i just mm -hmm. be curious how would you respond to yeah that? i agree with that approach i agree that um that science can and should uh when done correctly scientific evidence can and should um inform how we how we do also look at scripture i think they should impact each other uh, and in fact, the the early these early scientists that I talked about believe the same way. Um, a lot of them believe that you could actually test um, Christianity using science, and they would. I believe Francis Bacon was a very strong. He said you can test Christianity based on science, and so you have science informing your biblical interpretation, and you have your biblical interpretation form uh, informing science. Um, one instance of that happening is with the uh, heliocentric and geocentric solar system. You had Galileo and Copernicus proposing that the earth was actually not the center of the solar system. And the church was going to push back on them because the church reads things in the book, like God laid the foundations of the earth and the earth shall not move. Mm -hmm. Right. And they read that to mean that the earth stayed still. Um, but when you look at, you know, when you look at cosmology, it was too obvious 
that the earth is moving around the sun. And so it had to re reform the way that the that the church read that verse. And there was a lot more going on. There's a lot of political things going on there too. It wasn't just, it wasn't as simple as that. But you do have an instance where science is informing um, how you read the scriptures. So I agree with that in principle. But again, I would think that um, there are kind of two ways I can respond. One, I would just, I would argue there's a lot more evidence for a young earth and uh, a 6,000 year creation. Um, and there's just as much you can interpret a lot of the evidence as a 6,000 year creation. I think the evidence fits with a 6,000 year creation with some difficulties, but there's difficulties in all scientific models. I think the model fits. And then I also would repeat what I said in the lecture in that I think there's too many, there are too many um, sacrifices to the scripture. There's too many times you have to kind of butcher the word and what the word's trying to tell you in order to believe in it's definitely evolution, but mm -hmm. also, also in, in certain ways, an old earth, an old universe, mm -hmm. abandoning six day creation. So I kind of mixed a lot in there in the lecture. So some things were against evolution. Some things were against a non-literal interpretation in general. Um, I, I myself would read a lot of, of old earth creationists and what they say, and a lot of their evidence is very sound. And I kind of flirted with that idea for a while. Um, so I can, I can relate a lot to old earth creationists. It's when they start to accept evolution that I say, pause right there, because that gets into humanity that gets into all sorts of other things. So a lot of the Christians I, I quoted up here were not young earth creationists. They were old earth creationists, but I quoted them because they have great arguments against evolution. And I think we can certainly team up and do science together. If we disagree about the age of the earth. Can we really find a lot of common ground in science and scripture if they believe in evolution? It's a lot harder. That's kind of where I start to draw a line between um, not like, obviously, in terms of friendships or acting or being brothers and sisters in Christ, obviously, you can still do that. But in terms of of doing science together and working together in, in, in science and, and biblical application, they're going to accept evolution. There's a lot of there's a lot of leaps there that I have big problems with. And that's kind of where I, where I draw that line. So. All right. Well, it is 8.17, so we can finish up here. Um, but thank you all for coming again. If you have any, if you want to talk to me about any of this, I have my also QR codes for my blog and um, also some of my sources here if you want to check out, if you're interested and you want recommendations for books to find. Um, but I'll hang around for a little bit. But thank you all for coming and thank you. enjoy your snacks. Thank you. Thank you.